Hello, and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for today's Select Science webinar entitled Taming the Viral Beast, Applying LC and LCMS Technologies to the Analysis of Recombinant Adeno-Associated Viral Vectors. My name is Matt McArdle, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. I'm delighted to introduce today's expert speakers from Waters Corporation, Principal Scientist Stefan M. Koza and Senior Scientist Zimo Zhang. They bring several years of experience in LCMS method development to this webinar, and today we'll be discussing the challenges associated with analyzing AAV samples and how LC and LCMS workflows can help provide solutions. In the webinar, we'll also cover how to use size exclusion chromatography for AAV aggregation and titer analysis, how to optimize ion exchange chromatography for AAV empty fold capsid analysis, and developing LCMS-based methods for AAV protein and peptide analysis. After the presentation, we'll move on to our question and answer session. Please feel free to ask questions for the Q&A session at any time during the webinar using the tab at the left of your screen. Simply hover over the speech bubble icon and click to ask your question. Without further delay, I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Koza. I want to thank both our speakers for presenting to us today. Thank you, Matt, and thank you all for joining us today. Today, we're gonna to be talking about some of the application of our current LCA and LCMS technologies that we've applied for the analysis of recombinant adeno-associated viral vectors. This is a brief outline. Matt covered this a little bit, and I won't go into it in too much detail, except that we'll talk a little bit about gene therapy and analytics and how it applies to AAV. And then we'll go through some of the methods, and then Zemo will follow with a summary at the end. The title of this slide is Gene Therapy Comes of Age, and really it's going to focus on AAV. Gene therapy has been used for a number of years and investigated, but with recent successes, it's certainly seen a resurgence in interest. And there are a number of different ways in which gene therapy can take place. But for today, we're really going to focus on the delivery of therapeutic genes versus a modified virus. And in this case, we're going to focus only on adeno-associated viruses. In the course of this analysis, there are really two parts of an AAV viral vector for gene therapy. There's the vector or the capsid shell of a protein, and then there's the therapeutic gene that's going to be delivered within the, the uh, capsid. We today are just gonna focus on the protein portion of that. We're currently working and on and evaluating different methods for analyzing the therapeutic gene. And we'll be looking at such things as methods for capsid ID, empty full ratio, the purity of the actual sample to basically monitor the stability and the batch and batch consistency of those particular preparations. In terms of the analysis, of the AAV vector, we're really going to look at really what are the goals of these analytics? Are they stage appropriate? Are these methods going to be streamlined enough to really support process and product development, as well as make sure that we analyze the appropriate characteristics of the molecule in terms of the CQAs of the molecule and the protein structure, and eventually the DNA um, that's within the AAV capsids. In reality, these tests can be really time consuming. Um, in general, there's a really a lack of an established analytical platform for these types of analyses. Um, but even more importantly, and compared to a lot of our more current experiences with things like monoclonal antibodies, we really have a limited sample amount as well as low sample concentrations, which makes method development far more challenging. Some of the characteristics we're gonna look at for AAV, since AAV is the most used vector for these, are really, can we identify what the different serotypes that we're looking at are? These molecules are very big, and also we need to consider the biosafety level. And in this case, we're treating AAV capsids as really a biosafety level one. In this slide, it's really a summary of some of the methods we're going to cover today. On the left in the blue squares is really the traditional or are really the traditional uh, methods for the analyses of some of these AAV characteristics, for instance, for purity 
using analytical ultra centrifugation or AUC is commonly used. And we're going to show an example where we can get some of similar separations using SEC with either fluorescence or MALS detection. For the amount of capsid per mil, the content of the sample, ELISA is typically used. We're going to look forward and see if we can use SEC as well for this type of measurement. In terms of purity, and in this case, we're going to think about just the empty full ratio or the amount of DNA um, that is in a particular amount of capsid. Traditionally, that is performed by AUC, as well as some other measurements that we'll talk about later. And what we're going to do is try to apply ion exchange chromatography using fluorescence um, or UV detection to monitor that. In terms of purity, um, which is traditionally done by SDS Page, GEMO will look at reverse phase UV um, as well as MS detection to monitor things such as the hydrophobicity changes in the hydrophobicity profile fragmentation modifications to the structure um, in terms of capsid identity, where a Western blot of the VP proteins or viral capsid proteins um, will be looking at peptide mapping of those proteins to look at fine changes in the amino acid sequence and or the uh, post-translational modification of that capsid. So I'm going to start off with some work I've done on the analysis of these AAV capsids by size exclusion chromatography, looking at aggregation and fragmentation analysis for these capsids. To start with, we'll think about some of the basic principles of size exclusion chromatography, or SEC, in terms of understanding the separation that we're trying to drive for these AAV particles. The thing to remember about SEC is it separates proteins not based on their molecular weight, but really based on their size and solution. And the way that we can envision this separation taking place can be viewed in the bottom of the slide in the figures. If we look in the figure in the left-hand side, we have an image that represents the cross-section. We've taken a particle and we've cut it in half with a broad ion beam of an SEC particle. And what really drives SEC separations is, as the size of the particle is larger, as seen in the middle figure, it really can't enter some of the smaller pore volumes. And when it does enter some of the larger pore volumes, the larger particle won't be able to explore much of that available pore volume, and it'll be excluded from extending further into the particle structure if there are constrictions. So ultimately, the larger a particle is, the less time it will spend diffusing in and out of the particle, and the more time it'll spend in the flow stream. So those larger particles will come out first, and the smaller particle is, the more of the internal pore volume of the particle can, it can explore, so it will come out later. It's important to remember that in an ideal SEC separation, we'll develop a method in which we have ideally no absorption to the surface of the particle. We want the separation to be based truly on size. And as you can see, with those considerations, really the pore size and the pore volume um, of the SEC column that we select are really the most critical factors. And then in terms of driving resolution, it'll be important to consider the size of the particle as well. And this slide is kind of a thought experiment or thinking about how big these molecules actually are. So we're pretty used to looking at monoclonal antibodies on the lower left. They have a molecular weight of about 0.15 megadaltons or about 150,000 kilodaltons. And we can see that an AAV particle, as shown in the middle, is actually significantly larger in terms of molecular weight than a monoclonal antibody. It's about 32 times greater in molecular weight. But if we actually look at the size of these particular structures, the AAV, even though it's much more massive given its protein structure and the um, single-strand DNA that's within that structure, it actually isn't that much bigger in solution. So it's going to behave very similarly, although a little bit bigger, certainly bigger than a monoclonal antibody. When we start thinking about some of the other viral vectors that are used, however, for 
gene therapy, such as lentivirus or adenovirus, those sizes can approach 90 to 110 nanometers. So they're, now we're looking at particles that are four times larger than that of an AAV. And as seen in this picture, since you're going to see from the following data that the SEC column that we're going to have to use for the AV is just barely a large enough average pore diameter that this column will not work for such structures as lentivirus or adenovirus. So we are going to look at our BEH 450 angstrom SEC column for this was an average pore diameter of 450 angstroms. And we have a pre pretty good sense this column was going to be effective for the separation of AVs based on some previous data we had with IgMs. Now, IgMs are nowhere near the molecular weight of AAVs. However, based on their structure, their hydrodynamic radius is actually substantially larger. And we're able to find on our BH450 angstrom column that we could separate out the pentameric and dipentameric structures of an IgM. Therefore, we had pretty good sense that we could go in and look at and separate out AAVs that were either in a single state, so by themselves, or basically in a dimeric state where two AAVs are connected together. So we looked at the separation, and in this case, we started by just looking at an AAV8 sample that was considered a null sample. That is a sample that doesn't have any DNA in it because we didn't want to confound our UV and RI detection with the um, presence of that single strand of DNA. So we could basically show whether or not we could on this column and by monitoring the SEC MALS data, separate out the higher molecular weight or dimeric form or two AAV stuck together from the single AAV. And that's shown in the graph on the right where we can certainly separate out the AAV that's by itself versus a dimeric form of that AAV. One of the challenges here is going to be really concentration. Um, we had to take the samples that we had and actually get them to a concentration of nearly e to the 13th in order to get enough RI detection to make a reasonably good, although it's still quite noisy, molar mass assignment based on the malls. But we can certainly see that we can separate on this column these two particular structures based on size. So how are we doing this on a 450 angstrom column when our particle that we're separating or our analyte is really about half the average pore diameter? Well, remember, it is an average pore diameter. And I always like to look at really what's going on physically when you're thinking about SEC separations. So we can see on the right is an electron micrograph image of one of our BEH 2.5 micron particles. And we can see that for this particle size and for this pore size that there are a lot larger pore structures near the surface of this particle that are certainly capable of allowing AAV molecules to diffuse in and out of them. So what we envision happening here is as we get deeper into pore structure, we're probably going to eliminate a lot of the pore volume um, in terms of the AAV being, being able to access it. However, near the surface of the particle, we should have enough pore volume to actually for, drive this separation. And as we've seen with the previous slide, that's exactly what we've done. So given this, I just wanted to give a couple of thoughts about um, things that I found as I went through and tried to develop some of these SEC methods. Because remember, one of the important things we want out of this method is that we minimize the interaction of the AV, in this case, with the surface of the particle. We don't want any hydrophobic or ionic secondary interactions taking place and confounding our separation based on size. Some of the things I found as far as general method optimization is that I found that potassium chloride or KCL has been more effective than sodium chloride for minimizing some of these secondary interactions. I also found that addition of other um, salts as well as additives to the mobile phase, such as arginine or isopropyl alcohol um, and using citrate in place of the, um, or mess in place of the phosphate buffer really didn't have any significant benefits. I also found that as we talked about, the concentrations of these samples can be really low. 
And if you look on the right with a sample that's um, at about the uh, middle 10th e to the 11th um, concentration, we can see that the UV signal can get quite low in terms of trying to find low level abundances of the um, dimeric forms of the AV. And so what we've determined is that by using fluorescence detection, we can get about a tenfold increase in signal to noise so that we can get a much um, better and more precise, ac accurate measurement of the fragments that are in here versus the um, aggregates and the monomer as well. And so what we're focusing on here is the fluorescence is going to be based um, on the intrinsic protein fluorescence of the tryptophans that are in the uh, primary BP1, BP2, and BP2 proteins that make up the capsid shell. One thing to remember when using fluorescence is that when you measure the high molecular weight levels, they will come out a little bit different for UV versus fluorescence. So given the method development on AAV8 using partial and full AAV samples, um, I took the AAV8 method development and applied it to the separation of different serotypes of AAV from AAV1, 2, 5, as well as looking at 6, 8, and 9. And those are shown here. One of the things I found is that by altering the amount of potassium chloride in these samples, the different serotypes actually require different levels of potassium chloride in order to give a good SEC profile in which we can see that the main peak, um, the single AAV um, monomer peak, is coming down um, and actually returning to baseline quite nicely in all of these figures without the um, appropriate amount of potassium chloride, and its data isn't shown here, what we would see is significant um, time before we actually return back to the original baseline. And that's always an important thing to consider whenever you develop an SEC method is how quickly do you return to baseline. Next, we will talk about how we can apply SEC as a way of monitoring the capsid content of our AAV separations. It becomes challenging to monitor concentration of very large analytes, particularly as the analyte size approaches the size of our UV wavelength if we're trying to do UV absorbance or fluorescence. One of the ways that we can minimize that those changes is by making sure that our sample is always in the same matrix as we make these measurements. And what we are going to do in this case is use SEC as really a buffer exchange to make sure that our AV capsids are in the same buffer as they go through the fluorescence or UV detection. As shown on the right, one of the things that we did notice is that if we look at A280, because of the single strand of DNA that's in the capsid, we do get a significantly greater response for the amount of UV absorbance for the full versus the empty capsid. In this instance, we're actually looking at the response factor, which would be the inverse of that, and we're plotting it versus the mole fraction of full. In this case, we have, if the sample is fully occupied with single-stranded DNA, then the mole fraction of full is one, and if it's completely empty, the mole fraction is zero. So for A280 UV absorbance, we get about a three-fold increase in signal for the full fraction, the in X full or the mole fraction of the full is one versus when the mole fraction of the full is zero. Whereas for fluorescence, we don't really see much change, only about a 5% change. But we can use either of these methods as long as we can determine what the mole fraction of the full is for the sample or the empty full ratio can be derived from that as well. Ultimately, we can use either our anion exchange method that I'll talk about later or AUC or some other method for monitoring the empty full ratio in order to apply this correction. We can also see because of the difference that we have for the fluorescence that we may not actually need to correct for. It's only about a 5% difference. So if we don't require 
highly precise concentration values, and we can tolerate a 5% um, variation in those. Or if the samples that we're measuring really don't change, they're fairly consistent in terms of the mole fraction of the full sample, um, then we can really use fluorescence uncorrected. However, another option in terms of monitoring the mole fraction of the full will be to approximate that using our online SEC and really monitoring the A260, A280 ratio. And we'll show that on the next slide. Here we see on the left, SEC chromatograms, they're running about two minutes on a short guard column, a 4.6 by 30 millimeter, 125 angstrom guard column, which is basically a pore size that should exclude the AAV from most or if not all of the pore structure. We can see the fluorescence signals, the A280 chromatogram and the A260. And one of the things we certainly notice here is that the signal to noise will be better for the fluorescence. On the right, what we have done is we've plotted the peak area ratio for the A260 UV absorbance peak divided by the A280 UV absorbance peak versus the mole fraction of the full on the y-axis. And what we can see is that we can predict this curve as shown by the dashed line based on the mixtures that we've made and it matches up quite nicely. Now, we don't necessarily um, recommend this as a way for measuring an empty full ratio so because it will be somewhat um, more variable than using a method such as ion exchange or AUC um, but it's a reasonable approximation in terms of applying this to correct for our responses for our capsid content determinations. And that is what has been applied in this slide, where we can see that we have our different capsid titers um, ranging from about two. Um, e to the 11th to about 2e to the 12th um, for our SEC peak areas. And these have been corrected for their em measured empty full ratios. And we can see that in the um, orange, we see the fluorescence response and signal. We get a little bit better R squared than we do in the blue, but certainly the UV would certainly work. However, one advantage that we would have in terms of using fluorescence here is, as I said, if we don't really need to make this correction um, and we can tolerate the variance of the fluorescence, there would be an advantage there. But also, we can see that the fluorescence um, might be able to, based on just the um, signal to noise ratio, extend to a lower amount. However, we didn't test that in these um, experiments. And to wrap up my section of this presentation, I'd like to talk about some work that my colleague Hua performed in terms of developing an ion exchange method um, for the separation of AVs with an intent of looking at the empty full ratio for those AV preparations. AV separations can be performed on IEX. Um, there are, however, other common ways of monitoring the empty full ratio or the full empty ratio of these AAV capsids. Probably the most common um, sort of gold standard method that we see for this determination is analytical ultracentrifugation, where we measure the differential sedimentation rates. Uh, is a fairly time-consuming, labor-intensive, and it requires actually a good amount of expertise to generate reliable and reproducible data, it uses a large amount of sample. However, it does have the advantage that we can also pull out by AUC the evidence that there will be some capsids that don't have a full complement of single-stranded DNA. They'll have less than a full complement of single-stranded DNA, and those can be separated by AUC. Another way that we can monitor empty full ratios is Really, by spectrophotometry, we kind of saw an example about that as, as a rough approximation with the SEC work from before. However, to truly get this number to be um, more reliable, we have to denature our capsids 
and then measure our A280, A260 for the proteins, as well as for the DNA in a mixture um, and make our determination about what percentage of the sample was comprised of the protein versus which percentage of the sample is comprised of the DNA. One of the disadvantages with this method is that we do have to worry about um, interferences as far as UV absorbance. We'll demonstrate that ion exchange can also be used for this type of separation. The advantage of ion exchange is that it will use significantly less sample than the previous two methods, and it's fairly quick, but not really fast. Um, and ultimately, one of the disadvantages is that given our AV samples, as we change the uh, capsid structure, um, the sample may need, the, or the method may need redevelopment. We'll also touch a little bit upon the use of charge detection mass spectrometry for this separation. And I won't go that into that in too much detail except to show a little bit of data generated by Mega Dalton Solutions for us on one of our samples. But ultimately, um, CDMS will also use significantly less sample and it's certainly a more def definite measurement of the MP4 ratio. But it's fairly new technique and requires a lot of expertise as well. And as I pointed out in this slide, um, we can also get information on the partially full sample with CDMS. Shown on this slide is the separation that Hua developed for the determination of AVA empty capsids. So we had samples in which we had fully empty and fully full capsids, and we met, mixed those at different amounts, and we can see that overlay of those different mixtures on the slide and we can actually get a really a reasonable linear fit of the empty percent empty and um, sample for these particular capsid preparations. It's somewhat of a pseudo linear fit and as we can see this fit will really be dependent on how accurately we know the actual content in terms of capsids per mil of our empty sample and our full sample. So that will actually play heavily into how well this fits. On this next slide, we are showing the overlay of two of those chromatograms, the two where we have the fully empty sample, which is theoretically does not have any single strand DNA in it. And that's shown in the green chromatogram and then the fully full sample, and that's shown in the black chromatogram. On the right-hand side of the slide, we have examples of the CDMS, the charge detection mass spectrometry provided by Ben Draper at Mega Dalton Solutions for the two particular samples. One of the things I wanna point out with the profile in green is that for the empty capsid, we see a lot of charge heterogeneity that extends well beyond the main peak at 12 minutes, all the way under the empty peak. We were concerned about this. We didn't really know whether this represented partially full um, capsid or some full capsid. So by looking at these data with CDMS and looking at the empty, we determined by CDMS that it is about 99% empty. So we believe that that overlap of charge heterogeneity of the green chromatogram of the empty into the full is really based on charge heterogeneity of the protein structure, the structure of the capsid itself. So from this perspective, when we look at ion exchange as a way of monitoring empty full for AV8, and we weren't able to uh, obtain any empty and full examples for the other serotypes, but certainly for AV8, we won't be able to use ion exchange to monitor partially full um, content for these um, structures. And, and there's probably some error associated with even the absolute empty full. However, the advantage of the ion exchange in terms of being easy to run using minimal sample, in terms of helping to guide process development to improve productivity of these AV structures while making sure that the empty amount of empty capsid isn't actually changing that much. It still has some value as a uh, tool for that 
as well as a secondary method for monitoring um, M people ratios, maybe even further on in terms of product characterization. And as a final slide on ion exchange, here we show where the separation on this particular ion exchange column um, using a, uh, particular, a gradient, we can see that the different serotypes um, actually behave somewhat differently. Some of them behave more similarly, like AV2, 5, and 8 um, behave more similarly, whereas AV1 and 6 behave more similar to each other. And AAV9 is actually not well retained, and we actually have to reduce the amount of ionic strength in the mobile phase in order to get it to retain. However, what this shows you is that as you go from serotype to serotype or variant of serotype to variant of serotype, you may require some additional re-optimization of your ion exchange separation. And that is the end of my portion of the presentation today. And now I would like to hand you over to Dr. Jimo Zhang. So in the next part, I'll be talking about the intact and peptide analysis of the RAV capsids by using reverse phase LC and LCMS. So as Steve addressed earlier in this presentation, we learned that the shell of the AV capsids are comprised of viral proteins, including VP1, VP2, and VP3. And these proteins, in addition to protect the genes at the packaging material, they can directly impact the viral infectivity. Therefore, these proteins are always considered as an important part of the analytics of AV capsids. And as you can see on this slide, one AV capsid is comprised of six, uh, roughly 60 copies of the proteins. And then these proteins, the mass is around 60 to 80 kilodalton, so not that bad. And the ratios of uh, the three proteins are around 5 to 5 to 50, but this is just a rough number. And then the accurate ratio identity and purity are, uh, need to be characterized and closely monitored. As they, are, uh, as they are always considered as a CQA. So on the right side of this presentation, uh, of this slide, you can see that it's a screenshot of the presentation by Pfizer at WCBP last year. In addition to the traditional gel method, which separates the viral proteins pretty well, and they also developed the RPLCMS method in order to characterize the impurity profile of the sample. And uh, as this is a great work, and you can see the uh, resolution across these proteins are not really high, so that the ratio cannot be directly measured. So uh, in this part of the presentation, I'll be talking about how we developed a new method of, uh, by RPLC in order to directly measure the ratio, identity, and purity of these viral proteins. So uh, to develop the RPLC method, there are a uh, few challenges that we need to address beforehand. So the first challenge is that the lower concentration that we saw in the AV samples, which is like 10 to 50 times lower compared to our typical mass samples. And then another challenge is that there were always surfactants in the AV samples, such as paloxmore or PS80. And these surfactants can also mess up with the separation by reverse phase. And on top of that, we didn't have a lot of prior knowledge in developing this kind of method for the AV samples because it's relatively new and not a lot of literature uh, are talking about that. So our goal would be to evaluate our technology and going through the uh, extensive method development in order to develop the high resolution RPLC method. So our first step is to remove the surfactants in the sample. And as you can see on this slide, the upper left corner is the reverse phase analysis or formulated RIV sample. You can see the surfactants, the big peaks of the surfactants at the beginning and at the end of the, uh, the chromatogram. And if you zoom in the separation around 10 to 15 minutes, you can see the increase of the baseline, which are from the responses of the surfactants. 
And after developing a method to remove the surfactant, you can see uh, on the bottom of the chromatogram, uh, on the bottom of this slide, you can see the baseline is um, flatter compared to the top chromatogram. And that's from the reduced surfactant signal. And in addition to the improvement of the chromatogram, we can also see the reduced noise uh, of the ESI chromatogram. So as shown on this slide, the right-hand side, you can see uh, the before and after comparison of uh, removing the surfactant. And with the surfactant removed from the sample, the noise level on the ESI chromatogram, on the ESI spectrum is greatly reduced. And our next step is to develop the RF, uh, RPLC MS method uh, in order to achieve a higher resolution separation for the capsid proteins. So here uh, we start on our uh, the newest uh, MS platform, which is the Bio Core system, and we started from the BHC8 column, which is kind of like the golden standard of the industry for separating these proteins. And on the right side of this slide, you can see. The separation of the capsid proteins of AV8 by using formic acid. And you can see the separation is now really good. And we can, after the elution of the protein, we can also see the bumpy baseline from the surfactant. And by using a new um, mobile phase modifier, which is the LCMS grade DFA, we can see that the resolution across the proteins are increased. And also, uh, the baseline is flatter. That means the surfactant are being separated from the, um, from the protein. And also, the peaks are a lot sharper, which means some um, improvement on the MS signal, potentially. And other than the mobile phases, and the stationary phase can also uh, have an impact on the separation. So here is to show the comparison of different column chemistry uh, uh, on the separation of the VP proteins. And as you can see here, uh, compared to using C8 and C18 column, using the C4 uh, column can uh, provide better selectivity on the critical pair of the proteins. So at the beginning of the chromatogram, you can see the separation between these two peaks are increased uh, by using the C4 column. But that's not always the case. So during the method development process, we did observe the sample dependence, uh, sample dependence uh, on different AV serotypes. So on this sample, which is AV5, we can see that using the C4 column, uh, the resolution is still OK, but we're kind of missing the one of the VP proteins, which is the VP1. And you can see at the bottom of this uh, slide, which is the separation of using the C18 column. And then we can see the improved recovery of the VP1, and uh, which you lose later than the VP3 peaks. Uh, which, uh, and this, is, this might be because of the increase the hydrophobicity and that we observe from its amino acid sequence. And with the optimized separation, we're able to obtain the accurate mass of these uh, VP proteins. So on this slide, you can see that the uh, separation of the AV8 with the 0.5 micrograms of the sample on the column. And then we were able to obtain the masses of the all VP, uh, all VP proteins, including a fragment of the VP3, which labeled as the lower right-hand corner. And in addition to the accurate mass, we were, uh, we were also able to see the some selected modifications such as the phosphorylation. So on this slide, it shows the VP1 and VP2 with the, phosphor, uh, with the phosphorylation uh, observed in the MS spectra, which has the plus 80 Dalton mass shift. And with the UV detection, we were able to obtain the uh, relative abundance of each, uh, of each uh, VP protein. And as you can see, when the resolution is high enough, we can just directly integrate the peaks and then calculate the relative percent area of these peaks, and then we can get the ratio of the VP protein. And uh, the table is listed on the right side. You can see we're able to calculate the relative uh, abundance of each uh, VP proteins, including the fragmentation.
And similarly, as you presented at the beginning, so using the fluorescence as the detection method, we were able to increase the sensitivity of the detection. So um, here shows the comparison of using UV and uh, fluorescence as the detection method for uh, separating the VP proteins. And with the same amount of sample load, which is 0.05 micrograms of the VP protein, and we obtained about uh, roughly 20-fold higher signal-to-noise ratio level uh, by using the fluorescence. So with the optimized LCMS and fluorescence method, we were able to analyze a panel of AV stereotypes. So here listed the six different AV stereotypes, including AV1, 2, 5, 6, 8, and 9. And we can see there's a retention time shift on the main peaks of the AV serotype uh, on different AV serotypes. And uh, with the additional detection method from the MS, we were able to identify these separate peaks. And therefore, it can be used as a sign platform method for identification and also characterization of the different AV serotypes. So here, uh, I just want to show you a case study of how we use the development method as a, uh, to support the process development of AV factor manufacturing. And this uh, project was done uh, through a collaboration with Dr. Xiao Yingjing at Sanofi Framingham. And the beginning of the story is that uh, Xiao Ying observed some different potencies between the AV samples that she collected from different batches of the AV samples from the bioreactor. And then our goal is to see if we can compare the analytics of these samples and then uh, in order to understand why their potency is different. So um, the measures we decided to, to compare is that uh, one, the first one is the RPLC profile and also the ratio of the VP proteins, as well as the phosphorylation level of the, uh, of the viral proteins through MS. And then at the start, we separated the three different samples, 1A, 1B, which are from the uh, same batch, and also 2A, which is from the second batch with different potency. So the first thing we noticed that uh, is that the sample 1A and 1B are quite similar, while the sample 2A has a significant lower uh, percent, uh, significant lower uh, signal compared to sample 1A and 1B. And when we uh, overlay the chromatograms together, we can see that the uh, percentage or the VP2 peak is uh, significantly lower compared to the other two samples. When we uh, calculate the relative abundance and uh, make the comparison, you can see the results on the left side of this slide. And this is the bar plot of the relative abundance comparison uh, across different VP proteins. So uh, we can see from the bar plot, uh, the VP2, uh, the percentage of VP2 on sample 2A is uh, really lower than compared to the other two batches. And well, the uh, and also the percentage of VP3 is higher compared to the other two batches. And I know it's difficult to see, but there are error bars on this on this bar plot, and it's just uh, too small to see probably. That that uh, that error bar was from was collected from three different analyses, which demonstrated that the differences was uh, we saw here are real and not from the variations uh, variations during the analysis. And in addition, uh, the results we got here are kind of agreed with the CSDS analysis from Sanofi. So um, we uh, determined that we can trust the analysis method by the RPLC. And um, the level of phosphorylation is listed on the right side, which is quite similar. That you can see that the sample 2A does have a higher uh, does have a higher phosphorylation compared to VP1A and 1B on the VP2, and also the phosphorylation on the VP1 prime, which is one of the isoforms of VP1, is uh, slightly lower compared to the first batch of the samples. So generally speaking, uh, with the developed RPLC MS method, 
we were able to monitor the changes in the samples on, uh, from different batches and also provide information and also to monitor the changes in the process development. So the next part of this presentation is the peptide mapping of the capsid proteins. So the purpose of doing a peptide mapping on AV capsid, uh, on AV vectors are uh, having multiple aspects. So the first point is that we can use it as a method to ID the capsid proteins uh, or ID the AV capsids. So although there are only 13 common AV stereotypes uh, available now, but people are doing uh, molecular engineering to the capsids in order to change its transduction uh, activity and also other properties. So there are more and more AV stereotypes available and some of them are only differ by a few amino acids. So through the uh, impact analysis, it would be difficult to characterize the difference through the stereotypes, and peptide mapping would be a good method in order for identification of these AV capsids. And in addition, the PPMs, uh, some PPMs such as the deamidation, uh, oxidation, are difficult to uh, capture to be captured through the intact uh, protein intact uh, intact protein analysis, so that uh, using peptide mapping can also help with the uh, PTM characterization, and the peptide mapping can also uh, determine the cysteine oxidation state, which is kind of like the sulfide mapping, and can also characterize the anion and the impurities, such as the HCP analysis. And of course, there are challenges in developing the peptide mapping approach. So uh, the first one is still the limited sample amount. So if we have enough sample uh, of the AVs, uh, they'll be just like doing a routine peptide mapping method for MAPS. But then typically, uh, the, uh, the, the sample amount we're getting are around micrograms per, micro, per, uh, per milliliter which is really low and making it uh, really difficult to go through a, a routine buffer exchange step. And that poses the challenges in developing this uh, peptide mapping approach. And also the surfactants can also mess up with the separation of these peptides. And if we really uh, gonna do a buffer exchange to remove the surfactants, it will further reduce the recovery. So, which uh, making the development, which making the method development even more challenging. So, at last, we finally were able to develop a peptide mapping approach on the AV capsid proteins. So, uh, we dissociate the samples and uh, to capsid proteins, and then go through a buffer exchange through um, fraction collection, and then digest the samples and use uh, LCMS to analyze. Uh, these protein, uh, these peptides. So here uh, shows the results of the digestion, uh, shows the results of the digestion method. And this method uh, was developed with only 1.25 uh, um, microgram of protein as the starting material. And you can see that the coverage, the sequence coverage is pretty good. As you can see from the uh, coverage map at the bottom of this slide, and also from the bar plot at the lower right-hand corner, you can see for all VP proteins, the sequence coverage is above 95%, which is pretty good. And then uh, we are also able to locate the terminal peptides, as you can see from the uh, upper right-hand corner. Which uh, So here are uh, the MS-MS spectra of the VP1 and VP2 terminal peptides. And the masses are about like 2.1 kilodalton for VP1, and also just uh, only a few hundred of VP2. So we were able to uh, see the uh, good fragmentation pattern of these, uh, of these peptides, including a lot of BY ions, and which makes, uh, which helps us to identify, uh, the, identify these um, terminal peptides. So in addition to the identification of N-terminal peptides, we are also able to identify some of the modifications in the sample, such as the civilization, phosphorylation, deamidation, and oxidation. So here on this slide, you can see the chromatogram of the separated peptides. And down here, this is a little peak, uh, which is the deamidation, one of the deamidated peptides on the 
VP1 protein, I think. And here on the right-hand side, you can see that's the fragmentation spectrum that we got from uh, one of our newer MS instrument, which is the CNAP access. And despite of its low abundance, we were able to get a pretty good fragmentation on this deaminated peptide. As you can see, there's a lot of BY ions, which means the identification uh, is meaningful. So to summarize the presentation, uh, we developed a, a SEC method to measure the aggregation and the titer of the AV capsid. And also uh, using the developed ionic exchange chromatography method, we were able to identify the and analyze the MC4 ratio of the capsid. And also DSA uh, as the RPL CMS modifier, it can improve both separation and MS performance for the capsid protein analysis. And as always, the fluorescence detection provides a higher sensitivity in all the analysis that we, uh, that, we, uh, that we developed. And the peptide uh, mapping is kind of tricky because of the uh, low sample amount and surfactant. Uh, so it will need a complete redevelopment of the method. And if you are interested in any of the analysis that we're talking about today, uh, there were a few uh, AV application uh, notes available on waters.com, so the part numbers are listed on this presentation. And at the end, I just want to thank our colleagues at Waters who contributed to this project, as well as our collaborators at Megadot and Solutions for providing the CDMS results, and also our collaborators at Sanofi and BioReliance for providing the sample and serotype information. And at the end, I just want to thank you for your attention. And now that we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Koza and Dr. Zhang, for that interesting presentation. I hope that everyone listening enjoyed the webinar and found it informative. We'll now move on to the last part of today's webinar, the question and answer session. As a reminder, please feel free to continue asking questions using the tab at the left of your screen. Simply hover over the speech bubble icon and click to ask your question. And we've had a lot of questions come through, and our first one is, are there any examples for successful analytical chromatography of lentivirus? <clears throat> lentivirus, sorry. Do you want to take that, Simo, or do you want me? Um, it is for. Um, oh, okay, I can take this. So, uh, for lentivirus, uh, I can only speak to the LCMS part, probably. So. Um, uh, just like the AV, and we can probably use this uh, axis to uh, de uh, dissociate the virus, and then just uh, analyze the proteins for um, through LC and MS. And we probably need to do some uh, method development through that. But currently, uh, our lab is just the BSL level one lab, so we will need some um, some further development on that part. And in the future, we're probably going to look into that. And I would add that for the SEC and ion exchange, we haven't done any work with lentivirus as an intact molecule for those same reasons. Thank you both. Uh, next question is, which protocols could be applied for removing surfactant from AAV samples? Uh, okay, I'll take this one. Uh, this protocol was, uh, we recently developed this protocol to remove the surfactant. So uh, generally speaking, it's just uh, to use the Amicon zinc filter to remove the surfactant uh, by buffer exchange. So we have a detailed protocol, step-by-step uh, -step protocol listed, and if you're interested, I can forward that to you later on. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Michael, and he asks, is there any special sample preparation necessary for analyzing the AAV by RP chromatography? 
Uh, um, for sample preparation, uh, I think typically uh, people use uh, about 10% uh, of the acid to dissociate the uh, AV capsid uh, into the viral proteins. But uh, since the reverse phase chromatography is also in acidic condition with a pH 2 to 3 ish, and so uh, without any sample preparation, if you are sure that uh, if you are sure that your sample doesn't contain any messy stuff, you can just uh, directly inject the AV capsid. It will dissociate, but still, if you treat the samples uh, with the acidic acid for a while, you probably will have more reproducible results. Thank you. Our next question is. Um, does the SEC method detect peaks of AAV clipping forms? Um, I, I can take that one. Um, yeah, there was only one example, actually two, but the most predominant one where we saw protein fragments. And remember, we're using fluorescence detection, so it's selected for proteins versus um, DNA was, I think, the AAV9 sample that we looked at. And that's one of the advantages of the 450 angstrom column is you do have the ability to get a little bit better resolution on those fragment side of the uh, intact capsid. Thank you for that. And the same attendee asks another question, which is, were you able to identify the phosphorylation site by LCMS-MS? Yes, so uh, I've seen, um, specifically, uh, we looked into the sites for PTM uh, through the peptide mapping method. And through peptide mapping, we did find uh, different PTMs, and there were some phosphorylation sites, but um, since we're still under NDA with our collaborators, so we didn't put any of those information under the, uh, in the slide deck. Uh, but through the method we developed, we can see that there are some sites that are prone to phosphorylation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully you've still got the slides in front of you because one question actually asks, how much material was used um, for injection on slide 39? I don't know if you were able to answer that. Uh, 39? Um, which one is 39 again? Uh, let me check. Okay, so uh, slide 39 is probably the separation of the six AV serotypes by the optimized LCMS method. So uh, here the samples are from different vendors, so they have different concentrations. But they were uh, roughly on the range of the injection. The mass load was uh, roughly from the range of uh, 0 0.02 to 0 0.05 microgram, so around 20 to 15 nanogram. Now you can see the sensitivity. Uh, we still got a good. Uh, we still got the decent signal with that much of sample. Thank you. Uh, and we've got a lot of questions coming in at the moment. We're going to have time to fit in just a couple more, um, but keep keep them coming. We'll make sure we get to them uh, in one way, shape, or form. Uh, our next question is, under what circumstances would you recommend fluorescence detection over UV-based detection for the SEC assay? Um, in general, um, for the SEC method, um, we would typically recommend the fluorescence method simply because the sensitivity is just going to be that much better for the um, low abundance like um, aggregate forms or fragment forms that are generally present in these samples. Um, and you know generally the, these concentrations are low and I think using the fluorescence is go going to give you an advantage and it's also going to be very selective for monitoring the um, protein component versus um, the, uh, the DNA component that's in the samples. Thank you. I think we've got time just to squeeze one more in. Um, the short sec UV method for titan measurement seems to be more efficient. Is it possible to be used on E slash F analysis instead of IEX? Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, while it's, I think, a reasonable way of estimating the approximate empty to full ratio, um, one of the disadvantages is, that it is going to have is particularly as you get to very high purities, 
that the uncertainty in that empty to full ratio is going to get larger and larger if you look at that response curve. Um, so in general, what we position that method for would be if you're actually, if you're looking at samples that are relatively low in purity, so there's a fairly high abundance of empty, it may be a decent way of making quick estimates for those types of samples, but it's certainly not going to be good for looking at high purity samples. And furthermore, it will be good for estimating at the full ratio to make response factor corrections for um, the SEC method, um, tighter method. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank our expert speakers for today's informative discussion, presentation, and Q&A session. And thank you to everyone joining us online and for your interesting questions. I hope you found it a worthwhile session. I know we've had a lot of questions in today. Uh, and if we didn't get to yours or you have any other questions, please feel free to email me at editor at selectscience.net. And I'll follow up with, uh, with your questions for our speakers. Remember, you can download related resources in the tab at the left of your screen, including a certificate of attendance. And if you'd like to listen again to today's webinar or invite a friend to listen, it'll be available to watch on demand in a few days time. Goodbye and thank you once again for joining us.